Dear friends, welcome to the channel The Eastern Front. Today I will show you the first episode from the series Soldier's Memoir, which is based on the conversations of the writer Konstantin Simonov and people of seven nationalities who served as scouts during the Great Patriotic War about their hard work on the front line. These people are completely different and their work is very different now in the peacetime. But then in the war they all had the same job. Intelligence is probably the most difficult thing in the war, probably I think so. Because it's very complicated to go to the enemy armed to the teeth, crawl to a chain of German trenches, in addition engineering structures are in front of them, like wire fences several rows large and small. In addition, there are several rows of the antipersonal minefields of both pressure and tension actions. Also, there are anti-tank minefields ahead. All these obstacles should be crossed by scouts, still sneak up on the enemy, remove the sentry as silently as possible, or crawl up and descend into the trench and instantly grab, shove a handkerchief into his mouth, tie his hands and take him through all this. This is the most difficult part of the mission. Scouts go in small groups to take the enemy informant. The more people go on a mission, the more dangerous because there will be more noise. Someone will cough, someone will do something wrong. Then the scouts themselves can become an enemy informant. Therefore, intelligence is the most difficult thing in the war. At one time, I went in a group of artillery scouts. We used to compass, then walk along the landmarks and train the ability to choose them. According to these landmarks, it's necessary to determine where to fire. Then we were taught, so that the landmark in the binoculars plus, there is a sign there. And you watch when the fire is being conducted. And so you correct the fire, over the target, shot fall, to the right or to the left. And so they taught us how to determine where the enemy commander was sitting. Here for example, I observe a soldier walking along the trench. He approaches one point, let's say the entrance to the dugout. And so he begins to adjust his clothes, put himself in order, shakes dirt from his clothes and buttons up. So this soldier goes to his commander. And if it's, let's say, not a soldier goes, but an officer, and before entering does the same actions as the soldier. So there is a high-ranking officer sitting in the dugout. The high-ranking officer would not have adjusted his clothes if he has to meet a lower-ranking officer, it's accustomed. So, this is a command post. Now we have to find out the necessary information. Or during lunch a soldier goes and carries one pot. One pot means there is a commander. If a soldier carries a thermos, then it's already a whole group there or a department. It was determined by such signs. In 1942, in the month of October, together with many sailors, we arrived to replenish our the 45th Baltic Division, which was stationed in the Kaltusha area near Leningrad. I got into the 129 Guards Regiment, where we were assigned to the regimental reconnaissance. This is where our service on the land front began, and our naval service ended. Here we immediately began to study all the land-based wisdom of fighting the enemy. Ivan Pavlovich, last time I remember you told me that in the first reconnaissance it was not so easy for you to shoot at point-blank range at a person. Yes, there was such an experience. So, when we first went on a reconnaissance mission, I was in the cover group. When our main group take the enemy informant and began to retreat to their positions, the fascists obviously realized that something was wrong here. They decided to cut off our main group and thus recapture the prisoner, and in any case destroy our group. And that's a moment I remember right now. I happened to meet the fascists first, then for a moment pity appeared. I couldn't kill a person, I just didn't have the courage or strength to pull the trigger. Here is a living person in front of me. There has never been such a thing. I saw death, but I didn't kill anybody so far. But I overcame this condition, and when I pressed the trigger, I see the fascist fall. There was such a feeling like pity or something to kill a person. All through he's an enemy, and we have to kill him, otherwise he would have killed us. 
A variety of people volunteered for reconnaissance. The sailor Ivan Baranov also went near Leningrad, and Karol Kurkevich, who later ended the war as a submachine gunner and scout in a rifle regiment, went on his first sabotage mission in a partisan detachment at the age of 15. I had my first sabotage mission with a group of comrades. It was necessary to destroy one provocateur. We went to carry out this task, came, found this provocateur, read out the order that for treason to the motherland is subject to execution and we shot him in the forest. And who was he? He was a former military man. When the Red Army retreated, he stayed in the village. And what was the provocation? The provocation was that it came to the information of our intelligence that he had a connection with the Germans and when the partisans passed through this village, he pointed it out and the Germans made an ambush and the partisans died. So you shot him? Shot, as I said, yes. And then what happened? And then we made a stretcher, put him down, dressed him in our military uniform and carried him three kilometers to the central road, then put him on the road and hung up a field bag. In the field bag there were documents of gratitude to one policeman who was in the district center in Luban, which allegedly has a connection with the partisans. Thanks are given to him for his connection with the partisans. And this was a real provocateur who betrayed the party members, Komsomol members. According to his tip, a lot of people were injured. And so there was a task to actually eliminate this policeman. The next day the Germans were driving, they saw that the allegedly killed partisan was lying. They brought him to the district center. There these documents immediately got into the Gestapo. For tomorrow the Germans took this very policeman, this provocateur, and hung him up, which was what we needed. Almost every one of the scouts told me about their own war from beginning to end. One told more, the other less, but in the war each of them did everything he could for the motherland. Otherwise he probably would not have worn the soldier's order of glory of all three degrees on his chest. It was near Vitebsk. They were standing there. One division was standing. Well, when our soldier was stolen from us, the Germans went to the rear and did it. This division was replaced. We were in the second echelon on replenishment. We were put right in this part, changed immediately. That's what it means to take the enemy informant, both for us and for enemy. Due to the fact that the Germans took the enemy informant, an entire division had to be changed, another one put in instead. Yes, a whole division. When you took the enemy informant, they were probably forced to change them. Of course. We know who, how, who the division commander is, which units, we will find out everything then. He will tell us, he wouldn't want to talk, but he will. One day when we were on the defensive, a major came from the corps intelligence department and set us a task. And he says, comrades, we're standing here, a whole division couldn't take an enemy informant for three months. If some scout group goes, they will be discovered, fired upon by their return. And sometimes it happened that the group didn't return from a combat mission. They chose a place to go on land, and we already knew that on land the fortifications are good. There are a lot of mines, the Y is in three four O's, it's hard to get through. We chose a place in the swamp, all through the neutral strip was large, 800 meters, the shrubbery is so dense. We went for a first time after watching and got lost. We went in a circle and came out to our trench. The platoon commander is already ordering action. And we had a Siberian sergeant. Lazarev says, these are ours. The platoon commander says, if you disrupt the task, you will pay with your head. And he says, well, if I fail the assignment, then you can do whatever you want with me. Well, he proved that it was our trenches and we were one step away from attacking our comrades. You lie here, he says, and I'll go to the front line. And he went. It turned out that our machine gunners were sitting there. He was right. We came with nothing and didn't complete the task. The major from the intelligence department of the cops says, it's not good. We really need to take the enemy informant. The cops demands, the army demands. The next day after lunch we went, 
took two coils of cable, a telephone wire and stretched it through the bushes to a clean place, where we can already see where, so as not to get confused when we return back. This night we went on this wire, the suppers in front, the cover group behind. The suppers made a passage for us and we went to act. When we crawled into the enemy's territory, crossed into his trenches, it was rainy, it was dark, nothing could be seen in the forest, no one could be heard. And ahead of us, in the dugout, sparks appeared from the pipe. The platoon commander ordered to block the dugout. The commander's order is the law for us. We crawled the five meters to the right and heard the voice, Halt! Passwort! The Germans were asleep but probably woke up because they heard our noise and crackling. The German soldier repeated, Halt! Passwort! Well, then we immediately jumped out and got right into their trench to these Germans. There were two of them, they had a machine gun. We grabbed them by their pea jackets. Both were pulled out, the machine guns were taken away. We arrived at 4 o'clock already in the morning. The battalion commander also had this major there, the head of the intelligence corps. When we returned with the enemy informant, he shook our hands and ordered to the division commander to feed us and give us a glass of vodka, as it usually happens. To the foreman, he ordered us to give us the new clothes. You know, after you crawl through the dew on the water, the uniform instantly wears out, and he ordered everyone to rest. We rested one day, the second day. On the third day, we came to the division commander and talked. In the division we were promised that whoever touches the German first will get a month off. He agreed and the three of us went home. Intelligence as a rule is a night matter, but what doesn't happen in war? Our next hero among many of his intelligence services remembered exactly the one to which he was sent during the day, unexpectedly for him, but as it turned out later even more unexpected for the Germans. Said Nabi, so how did it happen that you went on a reconnaissance mission not at night but during the day? We found out the area, came back. I reported to the chief of staff that it was possible to take the enemy informant from here, even now. Please, if you can give me an order, I'll go now, this very night. Then he thought, no, it's better to leave this matter for tomorrow. Go, get a good rest today and tomorrow afternoon we will act. Did such an order surprise you? Why during the day? Yes, I was surprised. Why in the afternoon? Then he told me. He says, many units tried to take the enemy informant, but couldn't take it. No one could take it. If you succeed, let the chief of intelligence of the division and the chief of intelligence of the corps major general observe. He also said their last name then, but I didn't remember it now. That day we rested at night, we didn't go anywhere, it was just a quarter to twelve in the afternoon, so we went to investigate. We were walking the same way we had been scouting their air. And what was your neutral lane distance? Approximately 2.53 kilometers. And then you know, it's kind of lucky. I walked up between the two embrasures and sat down between them, and then I called the scouts, they come up. Were they crawling? Full length is not allowed. There was a sentry standing here. He saw me in Let's Run. He got scared and didn't even shoot. He ran away. I said to the scout who was on the left, catch up with him, only not far away, and come back now. He followed him. I immediately went into the bunker. I had the gun in my hands. I looked at the three sitting, and I said, and a hoch. They raised their hands. I see one can't raise his hand. I pulled them out of there, and the scouts grabbed them and ran. At this time I had three large caliber machine guns, removed the bolts and threw them into the river. We have no losses, we have brought these three Germans to us. And what do you think, when you jumped into the bunker, why didn't they shoot at you? Were they scared, right? First of all, when I went in there, they were doing something else. Mending trousers, tunics, you know. They didn't even have time to turn away to take up weapons to shoot at us. Of course, to take three Germans without loss in broad daylight, there is something to remember. Dear friends, that's all for today. It was Team and the Eastern Front Channel.
And as usual, I want to ask you, leave any comment and put likes, because it really helps to promote the video and the channel. Thank you so much and see you!